This conference will now be recorded. Well, good morning, everybody. For those that don't know, my name is Kelly Myers, and I am the Nashville Market President for City Current. City Current is an organization made up of over 100 partner businesses that have joined forces and funds to power the good in our community. And we really do that in four ways. Um, through business development and community events, through positive media, through uh, philanthropic initiatives and volunteer events. But during this time, we are unable to be together. So we're very thankful to our partners for allowing us to tap into their expertise and wisdom. Um, and so today we're hosting this virtual webinar entitled Managing Through Crisis. Today we're going to hear from um, top business leaders and our partners. First will be Du Tenen, founder of Skillway. Chris White, a partner with the Chris White Wealth Team. Jay Harville, Senior Vice President with Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. Mark Dedman, partner in charge with Barton LLP. And lastly will be Harlan Schaefer, the CEO of Human Capital Concepts. Our agenda today starts off with Du talking about how to continue to be resilient. Um, Chris will present information on your financial position. Jay and Mark will go over um, the unique insurance concerns during this time. And then Harlan will close with HR and staffing issues. We will be collecting questions throughout via the chat feature, so feel free to um, enter your questions. Just make sure that you share them with everybody so that we can see them. And we are going to be recording this, and then when the presentation is over, we will be emailing everybody the slides um, if, you, uh, if you like. So let's get started with Duke Tenen. Good morning. Yes, it is. I'm so thankful that we have such beautiful weather today to uh, to kick off our call. And, you know, as we talk about adversity, um, I think it's really important that we understand that we face adversity every day. And today it feels like a lot more adversity than ever before. So instead of wallowing in the poor me's, I'd love for you all to find some strength in hardship. For those of you who don't know uh, J.K. Rowling's backstory, she is the author of the Harry Potter series. She had incredible hardships in her life leading up to finally getting her books published. And today when she tells her story, she says, you are in control of your own life and your own will is extremely powerful. And so, as we think about the adversity that we face, I want you to think about how strong your will is during all of this. There's a psychologist, Michael E. Bernard, um, and he created a methodology on dealing with adversity. It's called the catastrophe scale. Um, I wrote a blog about it. So if you wanna go to my blog of Sales Coach Do, you can read the catastrophe scale blog that I wrote on this, but it's really worth investigating and learning more about. But basically, Dr. Bernard talks about ranking events in your life from one being very minor to 100, which is a catastrophe. And so one starts with the very, very trivial things. And then it starts to go up to less bad, to moderately bad, and then finally real catastrophes. And as we compare today's events, we could definitely be facing a real catastrophe. And that can also compare to how you deal with resilience. And resilience is typically compared to getting back or bouncing back to life the way it used to be, right? All we wanna do is we wanna get back to life the way that it used to be. But instead, look at resilience as how fast can you adjust to your new normal. Now, I'm gonna be the first one to admit, I can't wait for this new normal to be over <laughs> and start adjusting to our new life past COVID. But sitting and wishing that we were in January or December or November just isn't any healthier for you. Um, one of my very favorite books is a book called Resilience. And Tim Greitens wrote it, and it's a book about how when he came back from combat, and he is a Navy SEAL, now in government and politics, but when he was a Navy SEAL, there were so many SEALs who came back from combat, 
and they wanted to life to be the way that it used to be. And that's just not realistic that we are all dealing with adversity that we're not used to right now. So if you think about today's events in ranking towards losing your wallet or getting a flat tire or having to have minor knee surgery or something like that, really looking at how would you rank your ability to bounce back from routine setbacks and then take that opportunity to really look at how can you act through hardship and becoming stronger because of it. So really looking at this as an opportunity to become stronger, you know, instead of getting lost in the news and dealing with all of the adversity we're facing, some of the things that we can do is really bounce back quickly. So some of you might be thinking, do that's probably a lot easier for you because you are a very positive person, but admitting that resilience isn't in your nature is the same as telling yourself that you're not good at managing your time. It is a skill that you can learn and you have to practice to become better at it. And right now I am practicing my positivity because it's even a challenge for, for me today. So now I wanna share three ideas that I have on how you could have a more positive attitude. And the first one is to have a gratitude journal. Um, a gratitude journal is simply writing down three to five things every single day that you're grateful for. Three to five things, that's it. Today in my gratitude journal, I wrote, I am thankful for my shame, which is my husband because he is so strong for me right now. I wrote down the birds singing because that was, um, that was a great opportunity. And the third thing is I said, I am grateful for City Current because I love my partners within City Current. Those were the three things that I wrote down today. They're no big deal, they're not mind blowing, but they're three things I'm grateful for today that really start it. The second thing that I'm gonna talk about is having fun. I know that we are in a very challenging time, but I do recommend that you put together a puzzle, you play games, you find some ways to have um, a happy hour with your friends or have dinner with your friends through, you know, whether you use Zoom or whether you use the house party app or Google Duo. I mean, there are so many ways that we can connect with people <laughs> to have fun and how great it feels. And then finally, virtually break bread with people. Being in person with somebody and having lunch together or having coffee together is so good. Believe me, I can't wait to hug every single one of you when hugging is finally safe again. But until then, I am just going to virtually smile and say hello and realize that we are completely in control of this. So starting today, here's my challenge for all of you. What is one thing that you could choose to be more resilient about? Kelly, back to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Do. And so, um, and I appreciate that because that's something I think we all need to remember right now when it is hard to be positive. Um, and now we are going to throw it to Chris White with the Chris White Wealth team to talk about some financial considerations during this very strange and difficult time. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Do. You're a rock star. You're so awesome. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole hugging thing is going to be real. Very real. Um, and so uh, it is, it's a strange and interesting time. And I'll tell you what, before I hop into my stuff, and I'm going to go pretty quick through mine because I could spend two hours talking about what I'm uh, today. And so we don't have that much time, but um, you know, it, it's an interesting time that, that we're in. That's, that is very uh, weird. That's the way that I've been describing it with people. There's so much uncertainty and sadness and fear and hurt and loss on one side, but there's also such beauty on the other side where um, we have been forced to slow down and we've been, um, we, we have the opportunity to be with our family and to be more intentional and slow down and just be. And so I was just reminded of that when I saw Isaac come in and hug his dad. There's such sweetness about that. Um, and so anyway, you know, part of part of the positive attitude piece, too, is choosing to be intentional and choosing to see it through a certain lens. Um, and so this time's on one side is a gift, but we sit in that tension, right? 
Um, so anyway, I'm going to move into the stuff that I was going to chat uh, about today with the CARES Act and how to cut expenses and also finding uh, capital. Um, I'm also reminded during this time, uh, as I as I look out and see everybody, and we're all touching our faces, um, this is a great time to not touch our face and not touch our 401k. Um, as my friend Shane Tenen, uh sent me a slide about, so that those are both very wise things. Um, all right, CARES Act. So the CARES Act was was this this stimulus plan that came out here a couple of weeks ago. Everybody's heard about it, I'm sure. Uh, 2.2 trillion dollars. Uh, trillions, a whole lot of money. Um, so 2.2 trillion bucks. And the government has essentially is essentially getting this out to the American public. There were two parts of the CARE Act, two two main parts. One of them was for business owners. The other part was for individuals. Um, I'm going to spend more time on the on the business owner side today. I'm not going to spend time on the individual side. Um, there is a lot. We've got some white papers that we can send out uh, on the individual side, and I think Kelly's going to send out the um, uh, my notes here today. Um, so. This again is pertaining to the business owners. So, um, so there, there's really two two main pieces to the business owner side of the CARES Act. You've got the Payment Protection Program, uh, which they're calling SBA 7A expansion. Um, essentially, 350 billion dollars are being uh, are are being given out. Essentially, um, it is on a first come first serve basis. So the application process started last Friday for corporations and partnerships. The application process starts tomorrow for independent contractors and sole proprietors. Um, that 350 billion bucks sounds like a whole lot, and it is, but it will go very quick. Um, they're giving loans up to $10 million for businesses with up to 500 employees, full-time and part-time combined. Uh, the, they're essentially gonna provide up to 10 weeks of payroll funds. And so there, there are some caveats. You've got to be careful uh, as to what you use the funds for, primarily for payroll costs. They actually expect 75% of that money to be used for payroll. Um, and they will check up on that. Uh, there will be costs related to the continuation of group health benefits, mortgage insurance, rent and utility payments, and interest on any other debt obligations incurred. Uh, prior to 2-15-2020, so prior to uh, just this past February 15th. Um, and here's a big caveat. The borrower must uh, maintain the employees and at the same compensation levels. Um, the, the interesting part about this SBA loan um, is that they, they are going to forgive the loan the first eight weeks uh, that you... Uh, the, the first eight weeks that you have that money, if it's used on payroll costs um, and those things that I actually just described, the rent, utilities, mortgage, interest, they will forgive that first eight weeks of the loan, which is pretty unprecedented. It's a huge deal. And so um, if you if you don't use all of it in that first eight weeks, then you would carry that loan. It must be repaid within two years at a rate of one percent. So it's super inexpensive. Uh, financing essentially the giving you know it's a it's a line of credit that they are providing at a really low rate and they're and they're planning on forgiving a good portion of it so um, payments are deferred for six months uh, any affected company can apply for this loan um, and there's no personal guarantee or collateral required so it's uh, again that 350, 350 billion will go pretty quickly, um, but it's something certainly worthwhile to uh, get your application in if you've not. And the recommendation is to go with your uh, with your your banking relationship that you've already got, um, because they're going to be able to help you sift through that quicker. So. Um, there's another quick part about it uh, for the uh, economic injury disaster loans and e emergency economic injury grants. Um, basically, this can be they're loaning up to two million dollars, um, but it can provide advances of up to ten thousand in a form of a grant and loan for other reasons than payroll. So the thing you've got to be careful of is you can actually get both of these, but uh, you can't use the funds on the same thing. So if you use the funds from this from the disaster loan from the grant for payroll, then you couldn't get the forgiveness that you would get on the SBA loan. So you got to be really careful um, with that as well. 
Um, rates are as low as 3.75%. 3, 3 um, so there's a whole lot more there. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Feel free to ask questions on the, in the comments section. Um, I'm glad to address them. And then I'm, I'm more than glad to visit uh, offline and, and walk through that in more detail. A um, couple additional opportunities is you can do payroll tax deferral, net operating loss, carry back, qualified improvement, property correction, uh, employee retention credits, and then also business interest expense, expenses deduction has increased uh, for last year and this year only. So there's a lot to it, but wanted to give kind of the high arching pieces because we've been getting a lot of information from a lot of different places and some of it's been conflicting. And so this is the most in, in up-to-date info that uh, that we've got right now. Um, the second part here is... Chris, about yes. that, we have two questions. Um, one is if you furlough your employees for uh, four weeks, for a few weeks, and bring them all back, can you still get the loan forgiven? That's the first yeah. question. Go it's ahead. a great question. Yeah, you do. You, If the workers have been laid off, you must rehire to qualify for the loan. Okay. And then the second question is how can one demonstrate that the loan was used for payroll if the money is um, commingled with other cash on hand? Uh, keep a really good paper trail would be would would be my recommendation. You want to be able to document that the monies that came in um, are being used specifically for the for for what they intend, what the government intends for you to use that money for. So keep a really good paper trail. Um, this is all so new, so there's probably not necessarily a best practices yet. The monies haven't even gone out yet. Um, if it were me and I was receiving the loan, I would probably maybe look at actually not commingling those monies and keep them separate so that you could have a very defined paper trail. That would be the cleanest way to do it um, because they, the government has it has said that they're going to they, they are going to check up on everything because they want to make sure that the funds are being used um, for those reasons. All right. Awesome. Back to number two. Thank you. Uh, number two, so so where to cut? Um, this is a this is something that I would highly encourage people to do. If you go down to D, this is best to do before crisis strikes. Um, but in times of crisis, this is also something that is worthwhile for us to uh, to evaluate. So evaluate your expenses. Um, I would I would recommend to to separate your expenses in three different categories. So what is necessary, what is important but unnecessary, and then what's unnecessary. And very simply, take that bucket of expenses that are unnecessary and just get rid of them. Don't do those anymore. Um, and then if you need to cut more um, from a cash flow standpoint, then you can start cutting into the important, uh, important but unnecessary category. Uh, I would call that a skeleton budget is essentially what it, what it is. And so um, it is a great, great thing uh, to do right now to quote unquote, stop some of the bleeding, um, as folks would say. Um, and the other thing to look at too, is what can you do more cost effectively? So, you know, do you have some great pins that you spend a dollar each and could you scale back and spend 70 cents on each one of them? Do you get your paper from a certain place? Maybe you could cut back some costs, toners, yeah, you know, all these different small expenses that we've got. Um, you know, talking to or, or interviewing your service providers right now, it's a great time to look and see if you can get more bang for your buck. But these small adjustments add up uh, and can become pretty large numbers over time if you continue to make these small tweaks and changes. Um, and then the third and final piece here is finding capital. Um, you know, one, one simple way to find capital is if you already have the capital in an emergency fund or emergency cash reserves. Um, dear friend of, of mine has a six month emergency fund in their business, um, which is pretty awesome in times like this because they are not concerned about um, where where their, their income is gonna come from next month because they still have income coming in, but if they've got to supplement a little bit, they can go to their emergency cash reserves. And so, it is a prudent step to have emergency cash reserves um, in your, not only in your personal life, but also in your business. Um, the second piece there is lines of credit. Um, 
I have been on multiple calls with business owners where um, I've heard several people say that they are pulling down on their lines of credit right now and, and gaining that liquidity um, for two main reasons. Uh, the first reason is because they're, they're not sure about the liquidity that if they could have that liquidity in the future, just given all of the wild things going on and that are going to go on in our economy um, and with the banking system. And Harlan brought up a great point, too, is that some folks are concerned that the banks might actually pull back those lines of credit because they can't provide the liquidity. So um, the thing we've got to be careful of is when we draw down on those lines of credit, we begin to pay interest on the amount that we draw down on. So something to be very cognizant of, um, but could be a way to, to have that liquidity uh, if needed. And the third, the, the last part is connect with service providers. Um, I've really been struck lately about um, just how global this thing is. There's certainly not anything in my life, and I would argue in any of our lives, that has affected every single person on this planet at the same exact time. So we're all in this together, literally. So so what, what we're seeing is we're seeing service providers, we're seeing um, uh, banks, we're seeing all these various institutions and these businesses that are, everybody's helping each other out. And so um, it is very understandable to go to service providers right now and say, hey, I'm having a real tough time covering all of our expenses. Would it be possible to push my payment out 30 days or 60 days or 90 days? Um, again, we're all in this together. People are uh, I think at the core, people have a desire to be very gracious, um, and that's deep down inside all of us. And so uh, we are seeing the beauty of grace and humanity right now um, by by people helping one another out. So I do think it's a, it's a worthwhile endeavor to connect with service providers if you are having um, liquidity constraints um, to, to, to be able to see if you can negotiate a little bit. So... With that, I turn it back to Kelly. Thank you so much, Chris, appreciate you. And like Chris said at the beginning, he does have a little kind of a, a really great white paper on the CARES Act. And so we'll send that out um, along with the slides after the, the webinar. Um, and next, I'm so thankful that Jay and, and Mark have agreed to present because I feel like we are in some unprecedented times when it comes to risk management and insurance coverage. Um, things that people have never really had to face before. So uh, I want to throw it over to Jay Harville with Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance and Mark Dudman with Barton LLP to discuss um, insurance and legal concerns. Yeah, all of a sudden everybody wants to talk about insurance and law, uh, especially in this current <laughs> crisis. So um, unfortunately, it's challenging for our industries just as much as it is for all of yours. Um, we're going to run through this really quickly. Mark and I are going to talk fast. So once again, if you've got questions, pop them in the chat room or feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'll be glad to talk to it. Um, we're talking about business interruption in the beginning because that's a huge uh, media focus right now. Um, a lot of insurance policies provide some level of business income coverage. And what that's meant to do is pay for a loss of income due to a covered cause of loss, such as a fire or a tornado. Um, it's going to pay for the loss of income that your business suffers minus any expenses that wouldn't continue, such as if your building has been in a fire and is not being uh, uh, serviced by your electrical provider, you're not going to pay an electric bill. So it wouldn't give you money for those type things. Uh, it does not always include ordinary payroll which is one of the key uh, points when you're looking at your business interruption coverage is to make sure it does because you don't want to lose quality employees. The challenge in the current environment as it relates to COVID-19 is that business interruption is triggered by direct physical damage. And the pandemic, uh, the contagion, does not qualify as direct physical damage as defined by the policy. So that's the challenge and the rub where a lot of the coverage concerns are coming in. Mark, I'm going to let you jump in and talk for a few minutes. Thanks, Jay. And same thing, I'm going to talk very quick. There's so much. These are courses. These are careers that we're talking about in the span of you know, 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll go very quick. 
but please contact us if you have a question. Everything that Jay just told you is absolutely correct. That is the, the insurance company's position on all this. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. What I am saying is that there are two sides. You've got coverage and business interruption uh, and the property damage uh, prerequisite uh, is certainly what is provided for in the policy. Having said that, there's authority all across this country, not a lot of it, there's probably 12, 15 cases that stand for the proposition that something like a coronavirus might provide coverage. For example, there are cases, there is a case that has decided that ammonia uh, 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 discharge provided coverage when the ammonia came in contact with the property that constituted property damage. There is a case out there that stands for the proposition that bacterial contamination stand, uh, provided property damage. There is uh, there are several cases out there that uh, meth uh, amphetamine lab exposure, the chemicals from that constituted uh, damage to property. So again, there are a number of cases out there that can provide a foundation for making a legitimate claim. There's a lot more cases that go against those cases, but there's a lot of cases out there. And right now, cases are being filed all over this country to expand the scope of business interruption uh, coverage that's out there. So the question for a business person is, okay, Mark, I hear you that in fact, maybe I do have a basis for bringing a claim under my insurance policy, even though my insurance company is telling me no, that uh, a contamination such as this would not cover this. Where do I look in my policy to see that? We all as business people have different policies. You've got uh, workers comp policies, you've got automobile policies, you've got liability policies, you've got property policies. A liability policy covers you in the event of your liability to somebody else. So with respect to business interruption, your liability would cover you maybe uh, for business interruption you cause to somebody else. What you're focused on is business interruption to yourself. Mm -hmm. That is going to be uh, uh, very typically, uh, uh, if not uh, pretty close to universally in your property. And what Jay said is correct. You've got to have property damage uh, of some form in order for the, the coverage to trigger. Uh, typically, your business interruption is going to be an endorsement to your property coverage. So the first thing you look at is what is covered under your policy? Is business interruption even covered? So look for that. Secondly, is what is the policy period that applies? That's going to be very important with respect to the, the, the COVID-19. So what is the policy period and what is covered? After you do that though, uh, and by the way, look beyond the headings. If you have a, a, an endorsement that says business interruption, don't assume that you have business interruption because you got an, uh, an endorsement that says business in, uh, uh, interruption across the top of it. Read the actual policy itself or the provisions itself on the coverage. The next thing is, once you do that, you've got to look at the exclusions. So just because a policy creates coverage doesn't mean it doesn't take it away under the exclusions. And what you're going to find in many policies is that uh, 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 a pandemic such as this, a communicable disease is what it's called under policy, is excluded from coverage. That started back in the early 2000s after SARS and then was reinforced with Ebola. And the insurance industry realized they did not have the money to cover that. The insurance industry is very stable, very financially stable. But with a pandemic such as this, there's not near the money that would cover all this. So that's why the exclusion exists in the first place was because of events exactly like this. So. Uh, anyway, my point from that is, even though all that applies, mm -hmm. that there is an exclusion for, for the uh, uh, communicable disease, don't necessarily give up on that at that point. One is put your, your carrier on notice. What you don't want to do is not give the notice as provided for in the policy, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the law does shift, maybe in your favor, so then you give the notice only to find out you didn't give timely notice, and now your policy it's, or your claim is excluded because you didn't give timely notice. So even if it appears that you don't have a, a claim because it's communicable disease, give the notice anyway, the company will deny it and then wait and see. This is a, this is a contract action, so your statute of limitations is, is long. 
And that's what I would advise people on that. Next is on civil authority. There's also going to be coverage for actions of civil authority. I've read a whole lot on that. And by the way, I've had 20 years of insurance coverage. That's a big, major part of my practice. Uh, so I've had these issues uh, 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 in a number of matters through the years, particularly business interruption. Uh, I've had that even go to, to trial. Uh, usually insurance doesn't go that far, but I've had it go through through trial. Civil authority is when a government authority orders you to close your business. There can be coverage for that, but keep in mind that that coverage also is, uh, uh, arises out of your property coverage. Your property coverage requires damage to property. The best example I could give you on having civil authority and an order order you to close would be a hurricane. The government sees a hurricane coming and you are ordered to shut down your business. You shut your business down, you leave town like everybody else. The hurricane doesn't hit. Well, you will stipulate you shut it down because of government order and you shut it down and you didn't get business income. But guess what? The hurricane didn't hit. You didn't have any property damage. So it's not going to trigger. So same thing here. I say this, this is different. If the basis of the governmental or uh, your claim is going to be a governmental order, have documentation that in fact you had coronavirus in your facility. If you didn't have any in there to show, you may have the, the defense again presented to you that there was no damage to your property. So you need to confirm that in fact you've got that um, uh, under the policy. The last thing I'll say is, I don't mean to sound negative. I hope I'm not, but I, I know that I'm, I'm being very realistic on this. Uh, I wouldn't want a client of mine ever to think, you know, to have expectations beyond what could be delivered. A claim can be made. It may be tough given the circumstances of this case, may be very tough, but it can be made. But I'll point this out, and this is positive. You may have three or four bases for making a claim under your insurance company. So you have multiple causes of, of loss that you, you submit for insurance reimbursement. All you need is one, one to get reimbursed. For the insurance company to win, they've got to win every single one of them and show there's no coverage under any of those theories. So I don't mean to sound totally negative. I'm just trying to be holistic and, and point that out. Again, I know this is very complicated uh, and nuanced, uh, but I think it gives you a good uh, helicopter view of some of these issues you'll face on the making the claim. Jay? Yeah, and to Mark's point, the total estimated annual premium in the property and casualty industry in the U.S. is $651 billion. Uh, there's roughly about $800 billion of surplus that is meant to pay for all the claims that would arise. Uh, the estimated business interruption loss right now is $220 billion to $383 billion a month. So there literally isn't the money there. And one of the things that has been discussed is creating a federal backstop, uh, similar to what was done with the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, or even using the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act as the federal backstop to try to provide some uh, coverage under these policies. Um, our industry has been working really closely and trying to lobby for that because uh, they feel like they've got the mechanism from a claims handling standpoint to try to cover some of this. but the capital is not there unless there's some government intervention. So read about that, pay attention, because that could be something that impacts your business. Um, moving on, we wanted to cover a couple of things really quickly as well. Cybersecurity has become a significantly larger issue. Only about 10 or 11% of businesses have coverage for cybersecurity and cyber liability. So realize that your business is at risk right now. Uh, the rise in phishing and social engineering schemes, which relate to harvesting credentials or malware or ransomware has gone up dramatically. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, fraudulent counterfeit goods that are being marketed and sold right now, um, which is falls under that same category of cyber. And then just the enormous level of misinformation uh, the WHO has actually uh, declared this as an infodemic and has formed a team to try to provide factual data because of the risk to the public of how much is out there. So just recognize that your business, your organization has challenges now um, related to your employees working remotely that tie in here on the cybersecurity side. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? 
I've got some potential issues that that companies need to think about relative to the legal concerns and ensuring that coverage they do have isn't uh, uh, prejudiced or put at risk because of it. Uh, one is that uh, the cyber coverage makes sure that you have the safeguards in place that you are obligated to have under the insurance policy. The insurance policy is simply a contract. It's a contract by an insurance company to pay you for a loss in return for which you pay premiums and agree to comply with the terms of the insurance policy. So there may be provisions and probably are uh, very likely provisions in there that require you to have certain uh, IT cyber safeguards in place, like in a building you're going to have a fire alarm probably required. You may have sprinklers required. A fire takes place. They go out there and look at it. There was no sprinkler and there's no fire alarm. Well, your insurance policy very likely will not cover the loss you sustain. Same thing can happen on the uh, IT side. Make sure any safeguards that you're required to have in place are in fact uh, in place. The next is be aware that not only do you want your own things covered, that you want coverage in the event there's harm to others. For example, the government makes a claim against you for a data breach. Uh, information gets out relative to personally identifiable information. Make sure that the coverage you have gets you as close to the protection that you want as can be. The same thing with respect to release of third parties information that you're supposed to maintain in confidence. So you need uh, liability protection in addition to the property uh, protection, property is not going to cover you for liability, which we talked about early on. Same thing I said before, give timely notice of a loss. Don't wait to give notice of a loss until you get everything in place and confirm everything. Your policy, if you uh, uh, look in it, it's going to say duties in event of loss. And one of those duties is to give timely notice as defined within the policy. So make sure you give the notice to your insurance carrier within that notice period. Um, uh, be aware also that your policy is one that you need, that you may have had a contract with a third party to protect them uh, for information you may be holding for them. So you've got a, 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 a contract with a third party. Your policy may not cover that. The policy is intended to cover you. So if you're going to be maintaining uh, protection of other people's information on your system and you intend that to be covered, make sure your policy covers you as close to that as it can cover. There's going to be limitations to that. And then the most important thing is separate from all those legal considerations and insurance coverages is the worst thing many times can happen with a uh, cyber loss is the damage to your reputation. You can't insure that and damage to your reputation may cost you multiples of what all the other damages are that, that may arise. And I have a couple of takeaways, uh, Jay. I know that you have some. Uh, one is that we're looking back at the policy, what it means. We've talked about that. I think the most important thing that businesses can learn from this, and again, I spent 20 years doing insurance coverage, and then a, uh, a claim is made or a litigation follows, and it was all based on a misunderstanding between the broker or the agent and the insured. So if you're a policy holder, you need to get with your broker. Again, this is the, the what's happened now. It's like playing cards. We're looking at our hand and it's dealt and we're going to have to deal with that. Going forward, though, be proactive. Talk to your agent, your broker, say, this is what I do. This is what I've got to have protection for. These are the risks that I've got to mitigate. And by the way, this is the amount of protection I need. When you find out that you've got cyber coverage that only gives you or, or business interruption coverage, you've got a million dollar policy, but your business interruption coverage only pays $50,000. You know, what good is that? You, you've, you've got to understand what, what you need to be covered. So communication with your, your broker is very, very important going forward. Jay? Yeah, we're a little over our time. Just realize there's some work comp exposures that you need to be thinking of with your workers working in remote, remotely. There have already been claims filed, one that was filed last Thursday with an employee hopping up from their desk to grab their phone and tripping over their dog. Uh, now that is a compensable work comp injury because that is within the course and scope of their employment as they're working at home. Um, realize also that if those employees work, live out of state, and this goes on for more than 60 days, you need to add those locations to your work comp policy. Otherwise, that could impact your coverage and the benefits that are paid to those employees if they are injured. So just a couple of things to think about there. Um, Kelly, we'll get back to you. 
Thank you, Jay and Mark. Um, lots of information, but really, really good information um, to be thinking about. Um, and lastly, we're going to hear from Harlan Schaefer with Human Capital Concepts. And Harlan's going to talk about um, the HR and staffing concerns that we've got, again, during this time. Good morning. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to try to jump right into it. Um, uh, when you say HR, everybody would think oh, I'm going to do dig, dive deep into many of the HR laws um, that are impacted here. That would take way more time than this whole than this whole webinar would would, would allow. But I will touch on the Families First Act and uh, at the very end of this. So very first thing, let's. Um, what we're seeing in this world is, 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 and what we're telling everybody in our companies, and so we're living this you know, just like everybody else. It's not like our business is not being affected. It is, um, is lead with your heart, not with your wallet. And that's tough to do when you're seeing your sales decline or you're seeing customers where your pipeline evaporate where nobody wants to talk to you. Um, you know, we tell people be human to our, to our people. So whether we're dealing with our internal staff or whether we're dealing with customers we have to re remember that uh, first and foremost um, you know you're the leader in the company and most of the company people on this phone call have some leadership cap capacity um, just remember everyone is affected and from a personal experience with my staff i will tell you you have no idea who's going to be affected and how because the ones you think will just handle this without you know, like like nothing's going on. They're the ones sometimes that are flipping out, and um, other times, you know, they, it, it's uh, it, it's the other ones that are you think are going to fall apart are the ones like, oh, I got this. I've been through worse than this before. So, as a leader, your comp your employees are looking for guidance. They're looking for clarity. Um, they're looking for trans transparency and and frequency. So, you may think your company is going to survive. They, you, they may be thinking something else. So you need to make sure that you're being honest uh, and not trying to paint a picture that's unreal, but you are communicating to them not to worry about the fact that if you think that, I mean, our, co our companies are gonna be hurt, for example, both of mine, I have two of them, and both are gonna be hurt, but we're not going out of business, we're gonna be fine. And I need to be telling my, my employees that so, so they get it uh, time and time again. Um, I will relate, I'm going to try to do exactly what I say down here, use humor. Uh, one of my employees was explaining to me that she was having a tough day because her coworkers weren't co cooperating. And I was thinking she meant people that worked for us. And she, she now has labeled her new coworkers or her kids. So I always think that's humorous. And I've used that probably 50 times in different stories to bring people smile at her face. Um, I start every meeting and I think we need to, you know, everybody says, hey, how are you doing today? Just casually, it's a nice way to start a meeting. This, now we have to start them differently. I think we have to ask people, how are you holding up? How are you doing in this world? What's going on? Tell me, Let you know, you're becoming a little mini psychologist where they get to spend a few minutes of the meeting talking about what they're facing and, and it makes them feel better. We, every meeting, whether we have two people on it or we have 25 people on it, that's what we do. And we spend most of our time, a big part, some part of that time talking about a, a check-in. Um, I like humor. Sometimes I'm not really good at it, even though I think my jokes are funny. Others may not. But nonetheless, I try to use humor as much as I possibly can. And we all know that laughter is, is therapeutic. So I would highly suggest you make a, you know, what, if there's something weird going on in your life, tell, talk about it. Um, if there's something humorous in your life, talk about it, um, because then it opens it up for your employees to then do the same thing um, and then be, and, you know, to be human and, and share because they're like, oh, nobody wants to hear about the uh, this, that or the other. And then when they hear you doing it, they go like, OK, I'll tell that story, you know, about the fact that my kid had the camera on doing a Zoom meeting and I walked across the room inappropriately dressed and didn't have the, any idea that that camera was on or whatever it is it's, it's, it's funny you you know it just it just helps people laugh and, and move um, just like you're seeing us do right now uh, technology is remote workforce is it a lot of people have done a lot of that and it came to them very naturally some companies had to scramble and struggled with how to set up a remote workforce regardless it's it's kind of where we are right now um, technology is obviously important. We're using it today, right this minute for this meeting as an example of how it works. 
turning on the cameras. Um, I still struggle with this in my company where some of my people just don't want to turn the camera on, but I, but I would, um, I would suggest to you that, that turning that camera on matters. It's important to see someone's face and hear their, not only just hear their voice, but see someone's face and whether you're doing that internally or externally, I, I think it's a big, a big deal. If you haven't done a lot of remote workforce before, we have in our company, so this was very easy for us to transition. Um, it's important that you trust your employees, and we all say, oh yeah, well, I trust them. But then it's natural for many people to talk, to think about, well, like, I wonder what they're doing while they're at home. I wonder if they're working and or, or if they're not working. I can assure you that whether it's just being stuck in the house by yourself or whether it's because you have three new coworkers who aren't going to school now, um, you're going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to let them, you know, do things that you would never think of doing before and you're going to have to support them. And I'll give you one, one very obvious example is I have employees who go, who, who have to, they're homeschooling their kids. So what they'll do is they'll say, look, from, from two to four, I have to do this work session with my children. So I'm going to I'm going to not be working, but I'm going to go back to work at six o'clock or seven o'clock and I'll, I'll make up those two hours. Now, I'm not telling them to do that, but they mean they're committed and they're going to do it. But it is nice because we have work to do. Um, I mean, our work might have changed because we become we become educators instead of really doing our work now because that's what it is. This is the new normal. Um, I don't know how long it'll last, but um, it's there. I, I would also suggest that. Um, how the connecting with your people uh, frequently is very, very important, whether it's you doing it or, I mean, you should be doing it, but you know, if you start having a big staff, you can't spend eight hours a day calling people, you'll get nothing done. So um, one of my people decided today that, you know what, there, we have a culture committee and they decided the culture committee was going to break up everybody in the company and touch somebody every single day who was gonna get a phone, one phone call. Yeah, I'm calling people, my managers are calling people, but now the culture committee is going to do it as well, and they're going to touch everybody. So however you execute that, it um, it kind of plays out. This is where you may, I think, this these unsettling times are where you have an opportunity um, to to not only make life lifetime clients, but also to to make employees who understand that they want to work for a company who has who who understands them has compassion and has a heart and treats them almost like you would treat a family. So if your sister or your brother was having this problem, how would you handle it? And when I get when I get confused sometimes, that's what I go back to is like if this is my family, notwithstanding the fact there's somebody some people in our family we would rather not have in our family, but if you put that aside for the humor part, I mean, how would how would I treat how would I treat those people? Um, the next part is uh, a little confusing. Lay people talk about layoffs and furloughs. I'll just, because time is very limited, I'll just say furloughs are kind of, um, are usually very temporary. You furloughed somebody thinking you're gonna bring them back, you're gonna put them back in the same job. Layoffs almost overlap with furloughs. They sound very similar. They're usually a little bit longer. Most of what is going on today is some combination of the two. And it really doesn't matter as it relates to the laws and the compensation. It only matters as when they, they, they left your employment, were they paid or not, when you brought them back, or did you bring them back, and how does that play into the laws that are playing? So don't get locked up too much with uh, lays offs and furloughs. Um, the, the unemployment laws in every state have been extended by a federal regulation, and in addition, the federal government is has given people an additional six hundred dollars per week in unemployment. And again, I could spend thirty minutes or fifteen minutes at least explaining this. I don't have that much time. So the unemployment law is interesting, but that six hundred is on top of what they're already getting. And I think the max in Tennessee is like two hundred and ninety two hundred seventy five dollars a week. So all of a sudden, your employees could be getting eight hundred seventy five dollars a week in unemployment even if they didn't make that much <laughs> um, because the 600 doesn't have a step down. Uh, the 275 is usually a, like two thirds pay of their, uh, of their average pay, but anyway. Um, and then last but not least, the Families First Act, which um, uh, is, has two big, has lots of provisions, but the two biggest ones that people are talking about are the sick pay 
which is the first two weeks or the 80 hours, and then the, um, the what they call the um, Expanded Family Medical Leave Act piece, which is the next 10 weeks. There is a ton of confusion over this. We have put out, we're putting out uh, information pieces to our clients almost daily. If you have a need for some clarity here, um, I'll, I'll say that if you just ask the question or connect with Kelly, um, we will provide you whatever you want, whether it's marketing pieces or one of our people calling you. We're not going to charge you. We're just going to do it. Uh, just let us know. Just let us know, and we'll be happy to offer some assistance at this crazy time. But the sick pay part is is usually an 80 hour, two weeks. Um, it's usually for people being sick or something related to that. And the other expanded one is um, the 10 weeks is in addition to it's usually it's not for being sick actually it's actually for the for when you're staying home and caring for for others if you will mostly and mostly children i just tried to summarize a, something that's like 31 pages long so please forgive me if it wasn't exactly there's there's a lot of like branches of a tree of this is true except for this so it's very complicated but in any event that's uh that's that's the summary of of those two um there's tons of webinars. There's tons of, of pieces that are put out by um, law firms like Marks and um, and insurance companies like Jay's, but uh, or or th or companies like us as well. So, um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Kelly because we're running tight on time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, Harlan, there was one question, and um, if you if if you had just furloughed your employees for a few weeks, do you recommend that those employees also file for unemployment at the same time? Or can they even qualify? They can, they can, as long as they're, I mean, the, the unemployment law in almost every single state says, you know, are you, are you employed today? No. Are you being paid? And if you aren't, you know, no, you can apply for unemployment. So whether you said I'm furloughing you or laying you off, there's usually a one week, in some cases, a two week period, because most, most companies are in multiple states. So it depends. It's usually one or two weeks for a waiting period. Most of those have been waived right now by the federal government, um, you have to go to each state and look at it. So that would mean you could get paid unemployment benefits from day one. And if you look at this furlough for just a second, if, if you were gonna furlough people for a week, in most situations in the old normal, not the new normal, they wouldn't get anything because they had to have a one week waiting period. And that's usually what, it's, what it means. In this one, you probably could get benefits almost immediately, assuming you can get through the uh, and apply because every state's getting a little overwhelmed with unemployment claims right now so yeah thank you for that so right. um i don't see any more questions in the chat so with that um we will uh, we're about at our time limit um the contact information for everybody on this webinar is included and it'll go out with the slide so please please um, truly, this has been such a, a really informative session on so many levels. These individuals are true experts in their field and um, have hearts of gold um, and would love nothing then to, for you to reach out to them and, and they will be able to direct you in whatever way that they can. So I thank you guys so much for being here today and for giving us an hour of your time and we will see you again soon. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye.